epilepsy warning for flashing lights and colors. For over 30 years, the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror has stood as one of the most memorable thrill rides at the Disney World Resort. Combining features of a drop tower and a dark ride, it is often well regarded as an impressive feat of engineering. But what you may not know is that it was once involved in a serious and terrifying sounding accident all the way back in 1998. This incident led to seven people being sent to the hospital, but it has largely been forgotten over the years. This incident is a noteworthy piece of the ride's history, and a lesson in how smart engineering can prevent unspeakable disasters. So let's talk about the history of the Tower of Terror and its 1998 accident right here on Theme Park Crazy. Now let's go all the way back to the late 1980s when the concept of a Disney dark ride got its start at Euro Disneyland, now known as Disneyland Paris. Originally, it was envisioned as a first-generation drop tower by Swiss manufacturer Intamin. The ride would have been built into a volcanic facade and be themed to Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth. However, budget cuts led to the project's cancellation. A few years later, the concept of a drop ride was revived for the recently opened Disney MGM Studios, now known as Disney's Hollywood Studios. The ride would be the centerpiece attraction of a new Sunset Boulevard-themed area. The installation would bring a much-needed thrill ride to the solid but relatively tame lineup of film and television-themed attractions. At one point, Imagineers actually considered building the ride inside of an actual functioning hotel. That way, it could serve a double purpose of being an attraction and expanding the resort's accommodations. However, this was swiftly ruled out, as they realized hotel guests who wanted to relax would be disturbed by the screams of riders. Still, the concept of a thrill ride that took place in a hotel stuck, and Imagineers wanted to spice up the concept with a horror theme. One initial idea was for a haunted hotel, but this was rejected since it would be too much like the haunted mansion. Instead, Imagineers wanted the horror to be more paranormal and psychological, and one intellectual property fit that mold perfectly. Imagineers ended up taking great inspiration from the classic Twilight Zone TV series, and Disney acquired the show's license from CBS soon afterwards. Imagineers were attracted to the show's recurring theme of ordinary people experiencing the extraordinary. The program itself was an anthology series that was a mix of fantasy, science fiction, and horror. Imagineers would end up binge-watching every episode for ideas, and a solid story was soon developed for the attraction. Now before we go more in depth with this advanced elevator, sometimes we have trouble elevating and maximizing our potential. That's why I recommend this video sponsor, Strawberry.me. Now, I love what I do here on Theme Park Crazy. Making videos about theme park history and factoids, it's just something that I'm genuinely passionate about and I enjoy doing. That said, I've been thinking a lot about how I can keep growing and developing to make the most out of my channel. I want to keep leveling up and stay focused with what I'm good at to make the most out of Theme Park Crazy. That's why I started working with a certified coach through Strawberry.me. Strawberry's whole approach is about making personal coaching accessible and easy to use. From my own experience, they matched me with someone who's supportive and actually helps me think through my goals and create a plan I can stick to. We talked about things like time management, procrastination, burnout, and we developed some solutions like spreading my workload throughout the week and having a backlog of video ideas I can go back to. Now, coaching is vastly different from therapy. It's more about figuring out where I want to go next and having someone help keep me on track, think clearly, and follow through. One thing I really love about this platform is how flexible and easy to use it is. Whether you're trying to make a big decision, take on more responsibility, or just get clearer on your goals, it's a really helpful and empowering resource. If that sounds like something you benefit from, head to strawberry.me slash themeparkcrazy and use my code themeparkcrazy to get started today with a $50 credit. That's strawberry.me slash themeparkcrazy, promo code themeparkcrazy. And I'll also have the link in the description below. And while you're there, you can take a short quiz to get matched with a certified coach tailored to your needs. For jumpstarting your career goals and maximizing your potential, I recommend Strawberry.me. Special thanks to Strawberry.me for sponsoring this video. 
the ride's plot would play out in the same manner as a classic episode from the show. In the story, a group of hotel guests board an elevator, only to mysteriously disappear when the building is struck by lightning. The mark of this lightning strike was incorporated into the building's facade. After entering the hotel, guests are greeted by Twilight Zone host Rod Serling, played on the ride by Mark Silverman, since Serling passed away almost 20 years before its opening. Serling tells the story of the people who disappeared and invites guests to board a maintenance elevator in the boiler room on the second floor. He says, We invite you if you dare to step aboard because in tonight's episode, you are the star. And this elevator travels directly to the Twilight Zone. After boarding, guests are taken up to an unsettling corridor. Through a Pepper's ghost effect, they see the spirits of the people who disappeared. Riders are then taken up to a maintenance room where the elevator car moves horizontally. The room turns into the fifth dimension with surreal imagery surrounding passengers. Afterwards, guests enter another elevator shaft and are dropped down the tower multiple times in one of four randomly selected sequences. All four sequences feature the doors opening to give a view of the park, as well as one full drop down the whole 130 foot or 39.6 meter shaft. After completing the ride cycle, riders disembark on the first floor before exiting through the gift shop. The way the ride worked was way ahead of its time. Connecticut manufacturer Otis Worldwide was brought on to build the attraction's mechanisms. Yes, a real elevator company manufactured this ride, and what they were able to deliver was nothing short of innovative. Let's start where guests board in the boiler room. To maximize capacity, there are four initial elevator shafts in the back of the building. From left to right looking at the doors, these are named Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta, or A, B, C, and D. The vehicles are lifted upwards to start the ride through the use of motors and cable drums on top of each shaft. These drums connect two cables each to the elevator cars and function the same way as an ordinary traction elevator would. The motor spins the drums, allowing the vehicles to be lifted upwards. Meanwhile, guide rails on the side keep the elevator on its path during the ascent. Each shaft has its own corridor scene as well. B and C scenes are on the third floor, while A and D's are on the fourth. After the corridor scene, guests are taken up to the fifth dimension segment. To save on space, there are actually only two fifth dimension scenes set up in the building. One is shared by A and B, while the other is shared by C and D. Each pair of elevators has paths that merge into one. Now here's where things get interesting. The vehicles guests board are actually not the elevator cars themselves, but rather Automated Guided Vehicles, or AGVs for short. The AGVs actually enter large, empty elevator cars to be lifted upwards. Think of it like that episode of Top Gear where Jeremy Clarkson drives a PLP-50 into an elevator. In the ride's case, a locking mechanism is used to secure the AGVs in place during the lift sequences. For the fifth dimension scene, the AGVs exit the initial elevator shafts and follow a set path on the floor. This path has no visible rails or track. Instead, wires in the floor transmit radio signals to the vehicle to tell it which path to take. After navigating through the fifth dimension scene, riders enter one of two drop shafts. These shafts are named Echo and Foxtrot, or E and F. Once again, the AGVs are locked in place, but the lift system on shafts E through F is much more complex than shafts A through D. During the initial testing phase, it was decided that gravity alone didn't provide an intense enough drop. So on this ride, the motors on top of shafts E and F are designed to pull the cars downwards faster than gravity. This is done through the use of a closed-loop cable system. Like on shafts A through D, a motor on top of each shaft is connected to two cable drums. The first cable drum once again connects two cables to the top of the elevator car. Meanwhile, the second drum has two cables connected to the top of a counterweight, which weighs around the weight of the elevator car with an empty AGV inside of it. This counterweight makes it easier for the motor to push and pull the car. Finally, two cables are attached to the bottom of the counterweight and connected to the bottom of the car via a pulley system. This allows the motors on ENF to lift and drop guests at high speeds. This whole system has been widely praised for being ahead of its time, and it still holds up beautifully today. But now that we've gotten an idea of how the ride works, let's take a look at the accident that time seemed to forget. 
The following information was obtained through an internal report. I obtained this through a Freedom of Information Act request with the Central Florida Tourism Oversight District, known formally as the Reedy Creek Improvement District at the time of the accident. On Sunday, September 13, 1998, a nearly fully loaded vehicle with 20 people on board was ascending Shaft C. All of a sudden, guests experienced a mild but unexpected drop. At this point in the ride, the car isn't supposed to drop at all, so this was already alarming. After a moment, the car suddenly dropped at a much higher speed before the emergency brakes brought the car to a stop. Though the worst case scenario had been averted, seven riders were still injured and had to be transported to the hospital. Though the injuries were serious enough to warrant transportation, the Tampa Bay Times reported that everyone was checked out that day and nobody needed to stay overnight. Naturally, the ride was immediately closed and an investigation was ordered for the next morning. At 11.15 on the night of the accident, Reedy Creek Deputy Building Official David Young was informed about the accident and the injuries by Reedy Creek's Fire Department Dispatch. Young asked if the lift was shut down and was informed that it was. He then instructed the dispatch to quote, have the commander ensure that the lift would remain shut down and I would have the incident investigated in the morning. The next morning, Young instructed Reedy Creek Chief Rides Inspector Clark Godfrey to proceed to the Tower of Terror for an investigation. Not long afterwards, Young was told that his presence would be needed as well. Both Young and Godfrey quickly noticed and assessed the damage. As it turned out, two of the three bolts securing the cable drum's side support suddenly failed. With those bolts broken, the drum shifted out of alignment, creating a buildup of slack in the ride cables. This slack caused the elevator car to drop unexpectedly. Although each cable drum is equipped with a solenoid braking system, the initial drop was not fast enough to trigger the one in ball. When the car hit the bottom of the first drop, the resulting jolt was strong enough to snap both of the cables on top entirely. This caused a second, much more forceful drop. Fortunately, this fall caused the emergency rail brakes on the side of the car to kick in. These brakes worked exactly as intended, bringing the elevator car, with 20 guests aboard, to a sudden stop. To the ride's deserved credit, it is worth noting that these emergency brakes were not the last line of defense. Even if these brakes had failed to engage, the falling elevator car would have created a pocket of compressed air at the bottom of the shaft to soften the descent. Plus, there were shock absorbers at the bottom of the shaft as well. Though these aren't intended to catch a falling car, they would greatly aid in this situation. With the compressed air's help, of course. Believe it or not, there actually was a drop ride that used compressed air in the chamber as a brake. And I've covered it before on this channel. You can check out a link to that video in the description. When I first heard about this incident, the first thing I thought was that it occurred in one of the main drop shafts. But in reality, the car did not complete the show sequence. It did not reach the fifth dimension scene or the final drop shaft. Instead, the incident occurred early in the ride during what should have been a relatively routine lift up. So it was probably even more terrifying for the people who had ridden it before, as first-time riders would likely think it was part of the ride. Following the investigation, Disney engineers quickly replaced the bolts on all four show elevator drums. Though the ride was initially planned to open the next day, shafts A through D would gradually be cleared to reopen on different dates. Shaft C was the first to have its bolts replaced, being cleared to reopen on September 20th. Meanwhile, Shaft D was cleared for the 21st, Shaft B was cleared for the 22nd, and Shaft A was cleared for the 25th. In total, it took almost two weeks after the accident for all shafts to reopen. That said, shafts E and F did not have the bolts changed on their drums, likely due to the fact that their lift systems are more robust and have different, larger bolts. That said, based on insights I received from James of the Art of Engineering YouTube channel, the culprit is arguably pretty clear. Most likely, the failure was caused by metal fatigue, a common issue in high cycle mechanical components. Over time, repeated stress on the bolts may have caused microcracks that ultimately led to their failure. James also pointed out that these bolts were likely all produced in the same batch, increasing the risk of a wider issue affecting all four initial lifts. It's possible that lifts E and F also use bolts from a different manufacturer or production batch, lowering the risk of similar fatigue issues. 
Here's what James told me. Based on the fact that the ride reopened days after the incident, the failed bolts were sent for testing, and the manufacturer recommended changing the bolts on the remaining show elevators, it would suggest that they likely suspected fatigue failure of the bolts to be the root cause of the incident. However, it's not possible to be 100% certain without seeing the results from the lab. So far as I know, these lab results were never released to the public, and there wasn't really an inclination to since no severe injuries or deaths occurred. That's also why the accident report is relatively limited, and why there was hardly any media coverage. Despite this, incidents like this one are still extremely important to look into, not to scare people or claim a ride is unsafe, but to understand how complex systems can fail, and how they're designed to prevent disaster when they do. When an attraction as sophisticated as the Tower of Terror suffers a mechanical failure, especially one involving injuries, it just goes to show how much stress these systems endure every single day. And in spite of all of that stress, the ride still did its job and prevented disaster. No system is perfect, but the key to guest safety isn't a flawless design. It depends on fail-safes, constant maintenance, and the willingness to act quickly when something goes wrong. For all of Disney's screw-ups, this was not one of them. So while the 1998 Tower of Terror incident may have faded from public memory, it remains a crucial chapter in its history, as well as a learning experience for potential engineers. Fail-safes are crucial. Now it's time for the comment shoutout program. This is where I take five random comments from my previous video and read them out. These comments come from my video on disturbing Disney ride moments. Night Spawn Son of Luna 4936 says, Can I just say, the anglerfish in Finding Nemo is the main source for my complaints about Lantern being too darn cute to be an anglerfish. Seriously, Lantern, you're too darn cute. Knights of Arcronia 9968 says, I'm impressed. I thought I knew practically everything about the Disney parks, but some of those entries genuinely surprised me. On a side note, does anyone else wish they built Beastly Kingdom instead of the world of Avatar? Devon Bolden 2496 says, Why didn't Disney get a never-ending story? They could have taken advantage of riding a good luck dragon. You have a lot of mythos around this idea. Ride the good luck dragon and it'll be with you for the rest of your life. Imperial Officer 07 says, Wait, there was a clown with a help sign in the It's a Small World ride? Man, I only been on twice as a child, but I feel that clown's pain riding that ride. And Demented13 says, Went to Disney World when I was 5 in 1995. Rode in a dark ride that you sat in a car with a steering wheel and in one part it has a fake train coming at you. I ducked like that help. If you want to see your words in my next video, leave a comment down below and it may be selected. Please note though that inflammatory or spam comments will not be read. Thank you all so much and I will put a link in the description if you want to support me on Patreon. Thanks for watching everyone, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media on Instagram and Facebook, or you can check out my website at ThemeParkCrazy.com. And I'm on TikTok. This is Theme Park Crazy, and I'll see you all next time.